Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to the second in the London Sinfonietta's series, Introduction to Contemporary Instruments. I'm Mark van der Weel, Principal Clarinet of the London Sinfonietta, and today I'm going to be presenting a short recital of four pieces to give you some idea of the kind of work that a clarinetist in the London Sinfonietta um, would have to undertake. Um, this series, Introduction to Contemporary Instruments, will be live streamed every Monday at 5 p.m. for the next four weeks, featuring a different instrument each week. We're performing many different events uh, now in the near future, live from our homes in our Lockdown Live series. The details are all on the London Sinfonietta website, um, and in addition, there's a button on your screens, I believe, where you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, which will help you to get details of all these events um, direct from YouTube uh, rather more easily. Um, as we all know, arts organisations are in a precarious financial position at the best of times, so the situation now, as you understand, is extremely dangerous. Uh, therefore, we are all the more grateful for all the support we're getting um, from the Arts Council, um, from our sponsors, uh, individual donors um, at this time. Uh, and in my case, um, I'd particularly like to thank uh, Regis Koshfer for his uh, generous sponsorship of my own clarinet chair at the London Sinfonietta. Um, I'd also like to particularly thank uh, Natalie Marchant and Adam Flynn of the London Sinfonietta for their invaluable technical, musical and administrative support um, in my preparations for this. This is a new venture for me and uh, they've been invaluable in helping me um, with that. Um, by the way, I'm wearing this rather splendid um, London Sinfonietta t-shirt uh, for this recital, um, which was the t-shirt given to us to play the last concert we did live before the lockdown, which was a school's concert in the um, uh, Royal Festival Hall. Um, and amazingly, even though um, we've had such an enormous change of lifestyle with an enormous amount of uh, cooking and not much uh, exercise compared with our previous life of musicians as running around uh, as the proverbial blue-ended flies. Amazingly, after six weeks, the thing still more or less fits. I'm going to be playing four pieces this afternoon. Um, uh, Messia, um, um, quartet for the end of time solo clarinet movement, the Abîme des Oiseaux, the Abyss of Birds, um, and later on another substantial piece, Icon by Emma Ruth Richards. Uh, in between that, uh, th those two sh rather shorter pieces, I'm um, an excerpt from Boulez Domaine for solo clarinet, and a short postcard piece also by Emma Ruth. Um, I hope this will show some kind of range of styles that the London Sinfonietta plays. It, it, uh, it shows a range of music um, ranging over 72 years. Um, the Abyss of Birds, I must admit to rather um, hijacking this occasion to play a piece which not only shows my London Sinfonietta work, but which I hope will be rather appropriate um, to these uh, difficult times that we are living in. Um, it is a piece which has very slow outer sections, almost timeless and meditative, and a very busy, fast, um, virtuosic central section. And I think that sense of an enormous amount of time and space compared with the frenetic activity that we've perhaps been used to is rather explored in this piece. Um, also, uh, I think that it gives an almost religious feeling, messy, desolate. Um, the first section is very singing, and it leads to a possible loss of faith or loss of direction, which precedes the first of three very long notes, each of which grows in intensity. What will happen? Maybe something horrific. That is not what happens. Miraculously, Messiaen conjures up a kaleidoscope of birdsong, something of which he was particularly fond, and there is an enormous amount of birdsong in this piece. 
The piece was written in extremely difficult circumstances in 1941 in a prisoner of war camp in Görlitz. And you can imagine the circumstances of the first performance um, in Görlitz, which is now part of Poland. The performance was in January. So freezing cold with no heating at all, under terrible conditions. Yet this miraculously bright music was conjured out of that. Um, I don't know whether any of you have noticed uh, the increase in nature and birdsong around us since the human activity has reduced. Uh, we've certainly noticed um, rather more birds than normal visiting our garden at the moment. I just wonder whether Messian's birds may conjure up uh, some more in the garden behind me.
The Abyss of Birds from Messiaen's Quartet for the End of Time, uh, which I hope you found a, a good choice for these difficult times that we're living in now. It's a, an, an, an extraordinary piece, I think. Um, now I'm going to play something utterly different um, uh, by Pierre Boulez, who uh, um, in some ways uh, is the natural successor uh, to Messiaen as a, as a French composer, and in uh, many other ways, his antithesis. Um, and uh, uh, in his work uh, from 1968 um, for solo clarinet, Domaine, he explores probably many of the contemporary techniques that um, quite a few of you were expecting from a programme called Introduction to the Contemporary Clarinet, um, in the first place. Um, of course, there's a lot more to it than that, but um, Boulez does explore those techniques to quite a large extent. Um, uh, Domaine is an extraordinary piece, although it's over 50 years old now, it still seems utterly new. It's still as confusing, enigmatic, fascinating and infuriating as it was then. It consists of six cahiers or sketchbooks and another six books which are a mirror to each of these. I'll just show you, I don't know whether you can see very well, but that, that is an example of one of the, um, the cahiers. It has on it six little musical sketches, tiny little pieces of music. Um, and each of these pages has a mirror on which those six uh, fragments are transformed, turned upside down, played backwards in all sorts of different ways. Um, it's a piece which poses all sorts of challenges, um, particularly in the preparation. Um, it's incredibly free. Boulez gives many, many opportunities for choosing different ways to play the order of music in the page, different dynamics, the order that one plays the pages. Um, if I just give you an idea of the difference between that, which is the original printed music, um, and my own copy, which I've prepared um, for this performance, you see quite a big difference in the amount of, 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 of information. Um, uh, the, the mirror idea is, I think, quite an interesting one to pick up, and I think one that you'll be able to get um, fairly easily uh, in this performance. For example, this little fragment in the cahier, in the mirror, comes out as... It's not exactly backwards, but the names, the, um, the pitches of the notes are rearranged. Um, one gets quieter, one gets louder, one gets slower, one gets softer, and so on. Um, another one which I think is quite good to spot um, is this one in the original. Comes out in the mirror as... So uh, those, those should be fairly easy to spot. Some of them will only be a few seconds apart. In a, in a full performance of all six books, which takes 12 or 13 minutes, um, some of those transformations are maybe four, five, six minutes apart and therefore quite hard to spot. But then Beethoven did that sort of thing too. So uh, that idea is not so new. Boulez does explore various contemporary techniques um, flutter tongue, where I have to roll an R rrr, while playing. In fact, he combines it with a trill. Um, he uh, writes also a number of uh, multiphonics, split tones or chords. So, for example, this uh, note, he writes harmonique. So that becomes... And this note... So you have the original pitch but split into various harmonics. Um, uh, it's quite tricky to do at first till, till you get the hang of it. Um, I, I was rather bitten when I first tried to learn multiphonics because when you have to play multiphonics which require quite a complicated fingering. Um, I mean, this is not a normal clarinet fingering. So you get quite a rich sound like that. Um, uh, of course, these are sounds which um, 
uh, one possibly makes quite easily in the very early days of the clarinet, but it's, it's not unknown in the um, work of the London Sinfonietta um, to have to work rather hard to try to make sounds that we spent our first year of playing the instrument avoiding, um, but, 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 but that's life. Um, anyway, I programmed a piece by Magnus Lindbergh called Applauf, which begins with a multiphonic. <laughs> which is a pretty good statement of the kind of sound that the piece is going to, uh, going to present. Um, and I heard a recording of this. I thought it sounded absolutely fantastic. Thought, yeah, I'd like to do that. Then the music arrived after I had programmed it in a concert. And I found that that multiphonic is on the bottom, of, bottom note of the clarinet. No split fingering possible. You just have to voice the difference. Could I do it? No way. Weeks of and what I learnt from that, if you're having difficulty doing something, never let on that you are having difficulty. Because for all those weeks, I could not walk into the academy without every other clarinetist that I passed going at me. Eventually, I did manage to learn it just in time for the performance. So it was. Uh, so, um, I'll just play these uh, two very short cahiers, they're about a minute each, of Pierre Boulet's Domaine. Um, uh, you'll know when the mirror uh, comes because I turn the page. So that is uh, one page and its mirror um, from Boulez Domaine from solo clarinet of um, 1968. Um, incidentally, um, our flat here overlooks a communal garden and on beautiful sunny days, um, uh, uh, the neighbours have been, of course, using this garden to um, suitably socially distanced um, read and um, 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 sit and uh, and and in, enjoy the sunshine when it when it's when when it when it's been there. Um, yesterday, I was practicing and happened to look um, over the balcony out of the window uh, um, uh, during that, and the garden was completely empty. Whether that was the cloudy day that uh, had occurred or the boules, who knows. Um, uh, by the way, uh, there is a facility um, to ask uh, questions, um, which I'll be answering at the end of this programme, so please do send those uh, questions in as we go, and um, after the um, fourth piece, um, we'll round off just with, um, um, uh, um, as, as best I can, answering any of your questions that come in. Incidentally, um, any uh, clarinet players who happen to spot me... Um, uh, 
using my right hand to play what are officially left hand notes on the clarinet, just to head off any questions about that. That is a contemporary music technique known as cheating. Uh, it just simply gets a slightly better, uh, sl slightly better effect. Um, I had planned to uh, round off this recital with just a little uh, postcard piece um, by the British composer Emma Ruth Richards, um, uh, which uh, was a piece she wrote for a postcard competition for um, Endymion, the chamber group I play in, um, in, in, in 2013. Um, and I thought that would go rather well um, since um, the London Sinfonietta is currently running um, a series um, of, um, of postcard uh, um, uh, pieces live, uh, li 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 live each Friday. Um, so I thought it might go rather well with that. But a few days ago, when we sent Emma Ruth uh, an email to say, uh, would, would she mind if we played this little piece, um, she rather enterprisingly sent a score and uh, recording of um, a rather more major clarinet piece, it last, lasts about nine and a half minutes, um, called Icon. Um, for solo clarinet, um, written for my friend the clarinetist um, Alex Roberts. Um, anyway, uh, um, um, Emma Ruth said maybe since this piece explores a few um, additional um, contemporary techniques, um, for example, um, air sounds while playing, um, and uh, subtone tonguing. So quite a lot of tongue um, inside the instrument, but ha hardly any actual sound. Um, uh, she wondered if I could use the piece for demonstration. But as I looked more and more at this piece icon, um, I realised, uh, first of all, it's a, it's a terrific piece of music. And secondly, it went beautifully into this uh, programme. It's rather a contemporary mirror um, of the Messian in that it has uh, basically slow outer sections and a much busier uh, middle section. Although the uh, outer sections are rather calmer in general um, than the um, Messian, they're often very, very subtone, very long breathed, calm, very calm indeed. And the faster music in the middle, rather than being joyous birdsong, is often extremely angry. And I thought again that a piece which showed this enormous sense of space that we're all feeling um, in music, but also interspersed, and this piece does rather mix those elements up quite a lot, um, with um, um, anger and frustration, again, might... Uh, possibly be a little relevant and mirror some of the things that uh, we're, 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 all, we're all feeling at the moment. Um, Emma Ruth herself said, um, I wanted to uh, create a heightened moment in an improvisatory line so that the melodic line suddenly breaks into a fixed rhythmic cell to create a sense of pulse. Fixating on a small fleeting detail has a dramatic amount on the listener and orientates them within the space. Until this point, the boundary between silence and sound has been purposefully blurred. Some of it is, is very quiet indeed. And one slightly unusual effect that um, Emma Ruth explores in this piece is that she specifies exactly where I'm allowed to breathe and where I am not allowed to breathe. Normally, um, if there is a rest or silence in the music, the composer rather leaves it up, leaves it to us, um, to decide um, what to do. But she says that often when there's a silence, I should not breathe. I'll just show you an example. This is one of her phrases, with a breath. Uh, this is quite intricate, this piece, hence the glasses. but she specifies this. So um, uh, there is a silence, but I don't breathe, and one gets a sense of crossing that silence in a kind of sound which is uh, um, in, in, in invisible somehow. It's a beautiful effect. 
Um, and if I manage to do my job as well as the composer has done hers, you should actually feel that effect uh, very clearly. Um, uh, so here is um, uh, Icon for solo clarinet by Emma Ruth Richards.
That was uh, Icon by Emma Ruth Richards. And as a little encore to that, I'm going to play her tiny postcard piece um, called Interruptions. As you can see, it's a postcard with some music and holes in it. And the instructions read, to be placed over the piece of music already on your stand, play what is on the postcard as well as what you can see through the gaps. So I'm putting that on the last piece of music on my stand. 
which is the last page of Icon, and I'm going to play what I see. So that was Interruptions by Emma Ruth Richards, interrupted by her own music, <laughs> which actually uh, um, uh, works out rather neatly. Uh, now, um, it would be a good time for questions, uh, if I can see what has come through. Um, I've got one from um, Claire Dolding. How revolutionary were those extended techniques when Boulez was using them? What's it like performing in a world where composers are forever looking to push the boundaries of what the clarinet can do? Um, they were fairly uh, um, uh, revolutionary, Claire. Um, uh, uh, although, although 1968, uh, there, was there was plenty going on. There had been a book published by um, an, an Italian uh, player called Bruno Bartolozzi, called New Sounds for Woodwind. And this uh, um, really sparked off an enormous amount of uh, flutter tum tonguing and uh, chords and split notes and um, uh, all these kind of techniques that many composers used. Um, unfortunately, the book uh, uh, being written for Italian clarinetists, they have an extra semitone um, uh, on their clarinets, or they did then, and that has got us into um, all sorts of problem with, with fingering charts and trying to play those pieces on, 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 on contemporary pieces. So um, I would say that those techniques um, were probably very unusual and revolutionary for normal players, probably not that revolutionary by that time for contemporary music uh, specialists. Um, I mean, and uh, possibly now uh, far more of us are used to playing um, with those contemporary techniques than would have been then, uh, but possibly still uh, not all. Um, uh, in terms of what's it like performing in a world where composers are forever pushing the boundaries, um, um, challenging and exciting. <laughs> Is, is, the, is, is the answer. Um, we have to find a way round something. Um, it's rare to have to say to a composer that this doesn't work, but I hope that um, if we do say that, they realise that we probably mean it. Um, I've also got a, a question from um, Hector Gonzalez Orozco. Um, would you have any clarinet specific tips for young composers, maybe regarding issues that you've encountered recently? Um, I suppose in terms of contemporary music, the problem is, in particular with, 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 with very new music, that we have no models. You're presented with a piece which is possibly in a tradition that you're not used to, um, uh, possibly has techniques that you're not used to. Um, uh, um, if we get a piece by uh, Beethoven, Mozart, Brahms, which we've never played before, which does, 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 does happen from time to time, um, we've got the tradition of that composer and our knowledge of all their other music to go by. Often with contemporary music, we don't have that to help. Often there's no recording to help us. So where to start? And I can do the best I can do is by quoting the founder principal clarinet of the London Sinfonietta, Anthony Pay, who said, well, the best place to start is just to start to play it. So I think the difference with contemporary music is we may have to be practicing music initially that we don't understand and then wait for that understanding to come as we get more and more used to the music. Um, and I've got now um, Aha from uh, Melissa Damayan. Uh, what are your tips to approaching flutter tonguing to those who can't roll their R's? Are there other ways besides growling that can produce the same effect? Um, probably not. I think growling is the best um, uh, solution. 
Um, um, I mean, obviously, um, you know, if you can roll your R's, it's, it's, it, 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 it's easier to do. If you can't, um, I've usually found that if one can't do quite the technique that a composer has asked for, um, that if one produces something unusual, in other words, a not normal sound, which is as similar as we can get to the effect that they wanted, they will very often um, accept that. And uh, in fact, from time to time, uh, they even uh, might think that um, uh, that's what they had thought of in the first place. <laughs> that's a lucky, lucky break if that happens. Um, and then from Natalie, what do you think about when you are programming a concert? Um, that's an interesting one. It would differ, fr I mean, the, 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 the venue, the potential audience, what repertoire one had under one's, un, uh, under one's fingers. Um, uh, I have to say, in the case of today, um, I, I said that I, I, I had slightly hijacked the Messiaen Quartet for the end of time um, uh, for my own purposes, uh, because I thought it would be a very relevant piece to play in these times. Um, uh, I must say, uh, uh, one of the reasons that I wanted very much to program the Emma Ruth Richards icon at short notice was that after five or six weeks of pretty much full time uh, being a cook, gardener and watcher of Netflix and Amazon uh, um, um, series after series after series, I thought it would be damn good for me to learn a new piece. Um, so uh, that was uh, one, of, one of the reasons for the timing of that. Also, of course, it went very well in the series. Tim Gill played one of Emma Ruth's pieces a couple of, uh, a couple of weeks ago. So everything was right about that. Um, one thing in programming I think is useful, I think it, one should play a piece at the beginning of the program which is reasonably easy to understand. Um, Julian Bream in his autobiography talks about that because he said basically play a piece at the beginning of your program which the audience can, they can understand the music fairly easily, therefore they can just listen to you. And after a few minutes of that, they'll decide, well, this player's okay, now I can relax about how the player is and I'll listen to the music. Whereas if the first piece is very complex, um, uh, that process doesn't happen. And I think that's, uh, that's very wise and probably a good, thing, a good thing to think about. Probably nothing too impossible right at the start. I remember the London Sinfonietta did a concert in, in, in Turin many years ago and the first piece was really, really um, uh, uh, squeaky and all in quarter tones uh, for about 20 minutes. Um, and um, uh, our, our, our then trombonist, Byron's predecessor, David Purser, was sitting in the audience for that piece. And after that piece, somebody in the audience tapped him on the shoulder and said, are, are you playing in this concert? He said, well, yes, I am. And they said, is it all going to be like this? So, so put in something that's attractive to the audience at the beginning. Then when you've got them, you can be a little bit more uh, adventurous. Um, I think that's probably where we are with uh, questions. So um, I've finished answering questions and I've, I've, I've finished playing. Um, I'd like to thank you all very much indeed uh, for uh, watching and listening to me um, give you some idea of the clarinetist world in this programme. Uh, um, but, but please um, watch for the next in this series of, of uh, Introduction to Contemporary Instruments, uh, which will be at 5pm uh, next Monday, the coming Monday, um, which features our principal principal trombonist Byron Fulcher presenting a program on his instrument um, and uh, um, again uh, do subscribe to our YouTube channel that will help. Um, it only remains for me now that I've finished playing to join you in what I imagine quite a number of you have been doing I hope during the concert um, uh, which is this. Um, so um, I'd just like to say uh, um, um, please uh, in these times uh, um, uh, stay obviously um, uh, safe and healthy um, and um, look after yourselves. And on behalf of myself, Mark van der Weel, and all, all at the London Sinfonietta, cheers. Mm -hmm.